Good morning, everybody. So it is my great pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Paul Zyka. Um, Dr. Zyka will be speaking to us today about familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, this comes um, to us, and Dr. Zyka kindly has been accepted to give us this talk, um, as we have reached out into the community with the project that you all are aware of, Whole Me, and where Advent Health has partnered with the community to um, provide free genetic testing for familial hypercholesterolemia to over 9,000 participants. So we are well into post 1,000 participants already. So um, I'd like to make sure that you all are aware that you all can register. Please let your family members and community members know um, because this is a unique opportunity that Evan Health is providing to the community of Florida. Does not have to be of the Orlando region, anywhere in Florida. So Dr. Zyka was born and raised in upstate New York. He did his undergraduate, graduate, and medical studies at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. He received both a master's and a PhD, and then received his MD uh, degree in 1984. He did his internship and residency in internal medicine at Orlando Regional Medical Center. Currently, he is board certified in, by both the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Clinical Lipidology. Dr. Zyka entered into private practice in, the, in Orlando in 1987 and established the Lipid Clinic of Orlando. This is the precursor to the Florida Lipid Institute the same year. Since 1997, his practice has been limited to the evaluation and treatment of cholesterol and triglyceride disorders. He has been an investigator in more than 70 clinical trials involving cardiovascular disease, has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed medical journals, and has authored five books on lipid management and is associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Lipidology. Dr. Zyka is the founder of the Florida Lipid Associates and served as its president for 10 years. He is past president of the Southeast Lipid Association, CELA, and a former board member of the National Lipid Foundation and the National Lipid Association. He is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a fellow in the National Lipid Association. Additionally, he is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences at Florida State University School of Medicine, courtesy clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Florida, and assistant professor in the School of Nursing in the College of Health and Public Affairs at the University of Central Florida. Thank you, Dr. Zyka. Good morning. For about the next 45 minutes, I'm going to review uh, FH, familiar hypercholesterolemia. And just to give you some background, as Dr. Guerrero said, I've, I've been doing this for quite a while now. I follow about 150 heterozygous FH and about six homozygous FH patients. These are my disclosures. Um, both research support, current research support, and current Speakers Bureau participation. I'm going to start with a, a real patient. This is a 42-year-old who was referred to the Florida Lipid Institute by cardiology. He had an MI six weeks prior to his first clinic visit. He was on a beta blocker and aspirin. Review of systems was pretty unremarkable. Um, he was having intermittent chest pain for five years before he actually had his MI, and everybody attributed to reflux disease instead of heart disease. His father died of an MI at the age of 46. He had one, one of three other brothers had an MI in the 40s, um, and that one brother had, quote, high cholesterol, but he, the patient didn't know how high. The other two brothers had normal cholesterol, and he came in with an LDL of 240, and all of the secondary causes that we routinely screen for diabetes, hypothyroidism, proteinuria, were all negative. On physical exam, he had both xanthelasmas and corneal arcus. These are xanthelasmas. Um, it's not actually a very good picture. They're very discrete, raised little plaques, um, not 
like this amorphous blob that you see here usually. And this is corneal arcus. It's important with arcus that it be circumferential. There's a lot of people, as they get older, get, an, get a little arc at the top most pathognomonic for very high cholesterol. Not only FH, but high cholesterol. He had xanthomas over the extensor tendons of his hands, elbows, and ankles. These are pretty pronounced, actually. They're usually very subtle. And if you have anybody who's got a cholesterol, LDL cholesterol over 190, it's, it's complicated with a nomenclature. From the 60s to the 90s, FH was a discrete disorder of the LDL receptor, a mutation. Then from the 90s to about five or 10 years ago, the name changed to autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia because they discovered there was more than just LDL receptor defects. And I'll go over, there, there are ApoB mutations and PCSK9 mutations that are all considered part of autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia. And then about five years ago, we went back to the term familial hypercholesterolemia to include all of them. So there's the classic FH, which is a genetic defect in the LDL receptor, and that accounts for about 70 to 80 percent of FH patients. There's familial defective ApoB, which is a mutation of the ApoB, which is the ligand for the LDL receptor. And then there's a PCSK9 gain of function, there's, there's three PCSK9 gain of function mutations that all qualify now as FH. Classic FH, the LDL receptor defect, got started back in the 30s when there was a description of the familial clustering of high cholesterol, xanthomas, and premature vascular disease. In 64 was when the, the syndrome was clearly defined by Chakadorian in a founder population in Christian Lebanese. Um, Brown and Goldstein identified the LDL receptor in 1973 the gene was isolated in 84, and then the following year, Brown and Goldstein got the Nobel Prize for their description of their identification of the LDL receptor. The heterozygous form is the most, is the most common single gene disorder in the Western world. The, the, the prevalence keeps changing. Um, if you're taking the boards, the prevalence for heterozygous is one in 500. But we're discovering that there's a much broader spectrum, and in, in, it's probably closer to one in 200. And homozygous, again, if you're taking the boards, is one in a million, but it's, much, it's probably about one in 700,000. And I have never seen a true homozygous FH, where they both have the same genetic mutation. These are all compound heterozygous mutations. They've got two different mutations in the LDL receptor. So they, 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 they look like a homozygous. And I'll show you what, what that looks like on a lab report later on. But they, they're, technically, they're, they're homozygous FH. Um, and then, again, there are certain founder populations in the Ashkenazi Jews. The prevalence is about 1 in 67. Afrikaners, it's 1 in 100. Um, French Canadians, I've, we have got quite a few of those, about one in 200. Worldwide, about 10 million people have FH, heterozygous FH. Only about 20% of heterozygous FH people are, are diagnosed. And of those, even if they're diagnosed, only about 5 to 7% are actually being adequately treated. So there's a huge opportunity to improve cardiovascular prevention. The, the, this, most dyslipidemias that are acquired occur later in life, but this dyslipidemia is present from birth. You could actually make the diagnosis from cord blood. Um, and there's a big variability in the expression of this disorder because it's not one mutation. Um, the LDL receptor has got 45,000 base pairs. There's its location. It's, it's, 
distributed evenly throughout the gene. And if you remember your, let's see if I can get this thing to work. If you remember your genetics, this is the DNA. It's transcribed with the introns into the primary RNA. Then the introns are spliced out and you get the messenger RNA that's used to actually make the protein, in this case, the LDL receptor. So as of earlier this year, there were 1,300 distinct mutations causing classic FH. Um, if they're in the promoter region, it's the null allele. You just don't make any LDL receptors. And then in between, you go from the null to partial, partially functioning. And if you're interested, there's the website where you can, where they're updated. This is kind of a, a busy slide, but I want to go over quickly. This, this is normal LDL receptor activity. So the LDL receptor is this little blue thing sitting here in the coated pit on the hepatocyte. It binds the LDL. It gets endocytized. The receptor separates in the acid environment of the liposome, or, and then the LDL receptor migrates back up to the surface. This process takes about 20 minutes, and in the absence of PCSK9, that process can occur about 50 times to reuse the LDL receptor before it finally stops working. There are, there are five classes of genetic variants to where the first one is the null form, where you just don't make any LDL receptor. You can make the receptor and it doesn't migrate to the cell surface. And that's actually the, one of the mechanisms for the autosomal recessive form of FH. You can make a receptor that doesn't bind ApoB. It can bind the LDL but won't internalize or it's not recycled and is destroyed in the liposome. And that's what PCSK9 does. So th this is just a summary of what can happen between just not making the L LDL receptor, not letting it migrate up to the surface, not letting it bind the LDL, or not internalizing. And it, it doesn't show the, uh, the destruction but th with PCSK9. So, for heterozygous FH, anybody who comes in with an LDL over 190 should be at least examined to see if they've got any of the physical signs of um, FH. Homozygous FH have LDLs in the range of 400 to 1,000. Um, if, if you do advanced labs, FH patients are almost always pattern A. The LDL is larger, more buoyant. LP little a is always elevated in FH. It's part of the disease process. Between two and three times, the upper limit's in normal. Intermediate density lipoprotein and very low density lipoprotein are also elevated. I already showed you the corneal arcus. It's got to be all the way around. The xanthelasmas in the eyelids, the tendon xanthomas. In homozygous patients, they occur within the, in childhood. Um, in heterozygotes, they typically occur around the age between 20 and 30, but the absence of tendons, anthomas, or physical signs does not rule out the possibility that they have FH. Homozygous FH patients have their cardiovascular event in childhood as early as 18 months, um, and untreated, they're, they're almost always dead by the time they're 30 years old. Heterozygotes, um, typically present with coronary heart disease in their 20s, and as you can see, a very high mortality rate as they get older. I threw this in because this was just fairly recently described. Um, there is an autosomal recessive form of FH. It, the carriers, unlike homozygous FH, the carriers of autosomal recessive have normal cholesterol levels. Mom and dad have a normal lipid level, um, LDL levels, but
but the patients have LDL levels of 600. In my career, I've only seen one of these. It's very rare, and it is due to the fact that the LDL is not endocytized. And again, they, they're, they're founder populations in Lebanon and Sardinia, but the one I saw was here in central Florida. They have the tendons anthomas and xanthelasmas in childhood. Um, again, you, no family history, but a very high risk of premature vascular disease, just like a homozygous FH. Another form of classic autosomal dominant hyperlipidemia is familial defective ApoB. This is where the LDL receptors are normal, but it, the ApoB is such that the LDL receptor doesn't recognize it. First described back in 86, they have high LDLs, not as high as the LDL receptor defect, um, they do get tendons, anthomas, and corneal arcus. The incidence is about, again, 1 in 500 for the heterozygous. Um, one of the ways you can differentiate these is, is in this disorder, only LDL is elevated. LP little a is normal, IDL, VLDL are normal. And they respond therapeutically the same way that any FH patient will. And it's usually not quite as bad as the LDL receptor classic FH. ApoB gene is one of the largest proteins made in, in humans, 43,000 base pairs. Overall, there are nine mutations of the ApoB gene that have been described, but only three have clinical consequences, and those are listed down here. And then the third form of autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia are PCSK9 mutations, gain-of-function mutations. Um, PCSK9 is produced in the liver under the control of the steroid regulatory element binding protein, which has basically complete control of human cholesterol metabolism in the hepatocyte. And it, it was discovered about 10 years ago, well, not, well now probably about 12 years ago, but um, it, it binds to the LDL, LDL receptor complex when it gets endocytized and then prevents it from separating so that it's like an acquired classic FH in that the LDL receptors don't last very long. Instead of going 50 times around, they may only go once around. I already said that. Statins do upregulate PCSK9 activity, and that's one of the reasons why if you use PCSK9 inhibitors, You'll, you'll quickly recognize that the combination of a statin and PCSK9 is particularly effective in terms of lowering LDL, much more so than the sum of the two parts. And then PPAR alpha agonists like phenofibrate tend to downregulate PCSK9 activity. There are three gain of function mutations that are associated with autosomal dominant hyperlipidemia, and they're listed here. So how do you diagnose FH? Well, using just cholesterol levels is not a, a really good way. Like I said, when you get LDLs over 190, you should think about the diagnosis, but that doesn't make the diagnosis at all. Um, and there's a lot of environmental interaction. This is an interesting study that was done back in 1998, but there's a cohort of Chinese patients from a particular village in China, and a bunch of them migrated from the village in China to Vancouver. In China, the average LDL was 168, and they had none of the physical signs of FH or any of the premature heart disease risk. 
The group that went to Vancouver had an LDL of 290. This is the same mutation in the two people. It's, it's the environment, and these people had xanthomas, xanthelasmas, and an increased risk of premature heart disease. So there is a significant interaction between the environment and the clinical outcome. There's no internationally accepted clinical diagnostic criteria for FH. There are three of them that have been published. In all the clinical research I've done, we've only used one of those diagnoses other than, or genetic testing. Um, let me just go through these very quickly. There's a US MedPed program that depends on family history, and you can, you know, FH is diagnosed if you go over that cut point. I've never used this one, and I've never seen any research protocol that used that one. Simon Broom registry is kind of like ordering off a Chinese menu. I mean, if you got either A and B or C or whatever, um, and again, that one is used in some clinical research. But this is the one that we've always used. This is the one that, that I use clinically in the office. And this is a, a point system, basically. Um, you just add up the points based on the LDL, the physical findings, the history. And if you've got more than eight points, you have definite FH. This is accepted universally by insurance companies to qualify for PCSK9. Um, Genetic testing is pretty much the gold standard. And I mean, when I started doing this, a genetic test for FH was about $2,000. And it's now commercially available for about 40. Um, and a whole bunch of places can do it. And the current genetic testings do for FH, check for the LDL receptor mutation, like classic FH. It checks for mutations in the ApoB and in the PCSK9 gain of function mutations. So this probably doesn't project very well. But these are, uh, these are four genetic reports. This is from a guy who's got an LDL receptor mutation. This is the actual specific mutation. And it'll give you the, the heterozygous form. This is a guy with a gain of function PCSK9 mutation, a guy, a guy or a woman, I don't remember. Um, and it's heterozygous. This is one of the ApoB mutations for FH. And then this is one of the compound heterozygous, or the equivalent of a homozygous, who's got two mutations of the LDL receptor. One is a null allele, and one is a defective allele. This guy's LDL was only about 400. And he responded actually fairly well to uh, HMG reductase inhibitors even with one null allele and one partially functioning allele. He's now on PCSK9 and a statin but, and doing much better. But we, we talked a little bit about this earlier as to why to get a definitive diagnosis. First of all, you want a genetic counseling for the patient and the family. You want to do cascade testing. That means and all first degree relatives need to be genetically tested. And it's much, much cheaper to do once you, if, if you identify what the mutation is, they, they don't have to do the whole screening. They just check for that one mutation. It, the reason I do it is to get insurance coverage for PCSK9s, mainly. If they don't have the physical diagnostic criteria for the Dutch Lipid Clinic score, then we try to get the genetic testing. Um, you do want to do aggressive therapy early. They do respond, especially the heterozygous, to statin therapy sometimes. Like I said, the PCSK9 insurance coverage. And again, we were talking about this. The compliance, once the genetic diagnosis is made, the compliance gets much, much better, to up to about 86%. This is the diagnostic code for FH, which came into existence about two years ago, I think.
So back to our case, um, based on a Dutch Lipid Clinic score, he was 23, so anything over eight is de definite FH. He did have, we, subsequently we did uh, a genetic testing and he had a LDL receptor mutation that was not a null allele. One of his children had the same mutation. Um, this, was, this was back when the goal was less than 100. Now we want him less than 70, at least, um, and a non-HEL goal of less than 100. So we initiated therapy with, with a high-potency statin, added phenofibrate, and we recommended his son be started. This is just an overview of the treatment that's currently available for FH patients. The first and the oldest is apheresis. That's, it's getting more and more difficult to get that done here now. I think there's only two places in the state of Florida that still, well, three places in the state of Florida that still do apheresis. Um, but it's, a, it's like being on dialysis. They, they literally take the blood out of one arm, chemically separate the LDL from the blood, and then reinfuse the purified blood in the other arm. It takes about three or four hours for the process to happen. Heterozygous have to do it about once every two weeks or so. Homozygous have to do it once a week. Um, the, the, you know, the ileal bypass was done back in the 80s and early 90s. We don't do that anymore. But that was um, shown to be one of the first ways to reduce coronary events in FH patients. Liver transplant for homozygous FH are still being done. There's several medications now that are FDA approved or were FDA approved for FH, especially homozygous FH. Uh, Mipomersa is an antisense oligonucleotide for ApoB. We did a lot of um, research with that drug. That was the, the, the guy that had the the homozygous FH, the comp compound heterozygous lab report that I showed you, he was in that study. Um, they removed it from the market earlier this year. It, it, it works very well, but I had about four people enrolled and nobody completed the study. They all dropped out because of, after about a year, they started getting this like serum sickness reaction. Um, and the company just, it, it, the FDA didn't pull it off the market. The company stopped making it because nobody would use it. PCSK9s are effective in FH patients. Um, not just the gain of function of PCSK9 mutation, but all p p mutations except for two null alleles. Um, Evarocamab is FDA approved for FH. Alirocamab is not approved for FH, but it still works just as well. And then MTP inhibition, which is lomidipide, um, is approved for homozygous FH only. And then very interestingly, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, Dan Rader is doing genetic therapy testing right now where they take the LD, LDL receptor, this is an LDL mutation patients, but they take the LDL receptor gene give it a vector, which is some form of adenovirus. They transfect the LDL receptor into the patient's cells, and the LDLs drop. So with that, I don't know, I don't, know, I don't have a watch, so I don't know how I'm doing on time, but. It works both ways, actually. Um, but I would say about 20% of the people who were negative for the Dutch Lipid criteria turned out to be positive with genetic testing. But I've had, again, about 15 to 20% of people who were negative genetically, but who scored greater than eight on the Dutch Lipid Clinic score.
About 190. It's The, the lab company itself does. Well, yeah, I mean, all the, all the companies that offer genetic testing for FH all do the, the full analysis. And like I said, the price has changed a lot, but. How does niacin have any role in the disease? Niacin has got a bad rap, uh, you know, about five, ten years ago when there was this whole series of, of studies to show that niacin didn't do anything, didn't reduce cardiovascular risk or whatever. What people fail to realize is that um, those were people who would never have gotten niacin in the first place. And if you give a drug to somebody who doesn't need it, they don't get better, and the toxicity is a problem with niacin. Um, niacin was the first lipid-altering drug to ever show reduction in all-cause mortality in the coronary drug project. So I still do use niacin. Um, I mean, as an add-on therapy, usually. Um, the European guidelines do recommend niacin for elevated LP little a as well. So I, I do use niacin, and I've got several of my patients, especially before PCSK9s came out, where they would be on a statin, a zetamide, and niacin. Yeah, um, it, it, in the absence of some very, very rare genetic disorders, not FH, but other ones, ApoB and non-HDL are the same, or they, they give you the same information. So I don't do ApoB, almost never. Um, LP little a, though, does add some additional benefit. And if I get somebody whose LDL goal is less than 70, but their LP little a is significantly elevated, I shoot for an LDL of 40. I, I drop the goal by 30 points. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, they, they both, actually all three of the forms of autosomal dominant respond about the same to statin therapy. Now, very often you can't get them below 70 until the PCSK9s came out, but they all respond about the same. The only people that don't respond, well, they, even they respond a little bit, but if, you, if you're no homozygous, then PCSK9 inhibitors don't work and the statins are you know, they, they may lower the LDL 10 percent. So I'll um, ask one third question, and it's something that you have talked about before at the lecture. But I just want to drive the point home is that um, in the patients who you have of age um, and that you have either fulfilled the criteria by drug surgery or just met in testing, and you are going to use PCSK9 inhibitors, the PT found in the column relative to the value of maintaining benefit. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we did see, talked about that earlier, but um, like I said, I, I tried to emphasize that earlier, that statins and PCSK9 inhibition are very, very synergistic. And I'll put somebody on a PCSK9, and, and one thing that we're actually doing a research project now, there is a big variability in PCSK9 response. It's much bigger than the variability in, in HMG reductase response, statin responses. Um, and there's sometimes I'll put somebody in a PCSK9 with FH and their LDL drops to 100. This happened last week. LDL is 100. So I, and they're, quote, statin intolerant, which is what we try to do. So I, I put them on 
pravastatin 10 three times a week, which they can tolerate, and the LDL dropped to 20. Too low. I, you know, in, in both Odyssey Outcomes and Fourier, the two big outcomes trials using PCSK9, it looks like lower is better. There was no signal threshold that something bad was happening when the LDL dropped. Um, you know, I, I, I do back off if I get the LDL in the single digits. But other than that, I'm, I'm more than happy to have them in the teens. I back off on this. You can't, you, there's no dose titration with PCSK9s other than LA Rocamab going from 75 to 150. So in, in it, if, you, if you cut back from every two weeks to once a month, because we, we, we did that study like five years ago with um, LA Rocamab, the LDL goes like this. And the endothelium does not like the LDL to be changing. You want the LDL to drop and stay down. So you can't stretch it out to once a month. So you back off on the statin. A little bit. You don't stop the statin, but. Thank you very much. All right. So Dr. Daniel Lupu from the research division uh, is going to talk to us about the enriched population of home me uh, to invite all of you to consider your patients with prior CV events um, to partake of free genetic testing that also is extended to their first degree family members. It's just two minutes. <laughs> just a reminder, basically. It's fine. No, don't worry. Um, to show up. There we go. Ah, okay. So just two minutes uh, since um, um, Dr. Zaika was here, we could not miss the opportunity to remind everybody about our FH study. Um, and basically, this is it. This is uh, our hypothesis and aims. We want to see um, what's the effect of the genetic testing. Um, on uh, and physician education and genetic counseling uh, on patient outcomes. Uh, genetic testing by itself is not uh, necessarily the only, one, uh, the only thing you can do to um, change outcomes in these patients. We want to see what we are doing with these patients if we identif if we identify them and uh, what is their management. So we're looking for um, patients that have um, at least uh, one year history, post cabbage, PCI, ACS in um, Advent Health uh, locations and outside the Advent Health. Uh, everybody's welcome to participate. This is a study that will actually uh, observe the patient where uh, he's um, benefiting from care. So we will come to wherever you are um, and get that data. We will offer the genetic testing and uh, counseling, but also we'll uh, make sure that uh, physicians are involved and they're aware of the uh, newest guidelines, the new updates for um, uh, treatment, including the PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, and we'll just follow those patients for one year. Um, we consider this to be high-risk uh, uh, patients. 
And in addition to that, we uh, have a genetic testing and counseling for their family. So the labs that we're working with will uh, do free genetic uh, testing and counseling for uh, the families of all positive um, uh, FH patients if they get that particular um, sample, uh, saliva or blood from uh, the family in uh, 90 days, which is very important because uh, this way we can test everybody, it's uh, free, and we can uh, then refer them uh, further for care. Um, so that's basically it. We will, you'll see more of us around uh, where you are. We'll, uh, we're gonna come with uh, um, referral cards with more information. Uh, when we identify a patient, we're gonna have a specific letter letting you know that, hey, this is a positive patient um, and we want to uh, enroll him in our study. Um, and uh, thank you for helping us. That's it, thank you. <laughs>